Okay, we're working on chapter five in this video, and this is an important chapter for a lot of different reasons. So far, we've been kind of learning about like a lot of mechanical things about how to write code. You learn basic HTML, you've learned some basic CSS, sort of goofing around with how things lay out on a page. But really, when you're working on creating a website, it's kind of a little bit more of a holistic approach. And I don't want to ignore that fact, nor does this author. So this author really kind of presents the book in, in a fashion that I would typically do in a course as well. And that's one of the reasons I like this book quite a bit. Um, and that is, you learn some of the rudiments, but then when you start to build something, you, got, you have to have a target as to where you're going to. Now, before I started running this video, I gave the class an example of like, if you're going to build a house, you don't just run out and buy a bunch of lumber a hammer and some nails and just start building it. You usually like to have like a blueprint of some sort or at least a rough sketch of where you're headed so you know what to do. So these are the uh, outcomes in this chapter. And let's just jump into uh, the first slide here. Now, when you're building a site and they're giving us two different types of websites here. And one is very graphical, right? And the other one is very text-based. However, they are both very effective in their design, given what they're doing. Obviously, the top of it looks like, all right, we're going to do something with our kayak. There's a menu system across the top here, right? There's a graphic. There's not a lot of content on there. They're trying to grab your attention, right? This other one absolutely is intended, let's see, web design and instructional technology resources. Sounds like something that's geared towards me, right? It's something a teacher would look at. So it's just a lot of information. There's some bullet points or some links. It's very pragmatic and just gets the information out there. Two different audiences, two different looks. So you got to kind of consider who you're pushing a website to. All right. Now, the way that we work with putting a site together, there's actually a pattern for development. There's a, a few different ways that you can organize things, and, and they're listing them here as, as a hierarchy, as something that, that's linear, or something that's completely random. Most of the websites that we tend to look at, as a general rule, tend to form into a hierarchy. Okay? Or they appear to be very random. The ones that appear to be random are sites that are usually generated dynamically from websites. So as you guys like start to get further along in your web skills, you're going to you're going to find yourselves working with content management systems like WordPress for example, where the content is actually stored in a database and is rendered to the screen on demand. So there really isn't a hierarchy there per se, at least not an apparent one. Linear would be the example of kind of like this PowerPoint where I have one slide, I click next, I click next, I click next, and it you know goes from one to the other. That's example of linear. But a hierarchy, which is you know the most typical organization, is something like this. And what you're seeing here is a very primitive example of what we call a site map. And that's part of one of those assignments for this uh, unit number four. And that is this assignment here, where you're asked to create a sitemap. So I'm kind of pointing this out to you. So very often when we do this kind of a hierarchy, we'll have some sort of a home page. Now, I'm going to tell you that very often when I, when I see these hierarchy charts, we always think of the home page as being the top most level. But in a lot of considerations, I almost consider that this should be actually on the same level with some of these other menu items. I consider it a top-level menu item. So if you were to put home on the same line with about contact products, I'd be fine with it because I see it done both ways. This author obviously prefers that home is at the very top. But then you can see that some of the pages just come directly off of home, and then some of those pages also have sub-pages that go with them. So obviously if we go to a products page, we might have a category for widgets and sprockets, right? And then those might even have subpages or subcategories within them, and that would come underneath it in the hierarchy. 
you might create a website that only goes one level deep or you might create a website that goes 20 levels deep. It really kind of depends on your plan and, and what you're building. So that's an example of a very primitive site map, but it does show that there's some sort of an intent as to how you're going to do the work. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second and show you an example of some work that I've done in the past and a site map I drew from a conversation, just to give you an idea from this. But right, I, I'm not finding the actual file that I'm looking for, but the point I'm trying to make is that when I'm taking on a project, I'll listen to a client you know, for hire, and the client will say, well, I want to do this website for my business, right? And then, well, I want to have a page that tells, shows people where it's located. So that will maybe involve a map. And it, maybe if it's a restaurant, I'll have a menu page. Or maybe I'll have one that tells a little history about the place. And so what I start to do, just from the verbal description, is I'll take notes, maybe a bullet list or something. And then I'll translate that into uh, maybe even a hierarchy of pages and sketch it out probably by hand to start with. Pencil and paper, that works just fine. And then from that, I started to build out the site. So, but it starts with those steps, a verbal description, some sort of a sketch or notes or bullet list, whatever it takes for you. But very often, we'll go to this sort of a hierarchy to kind of start laying things out. <clears throat> Moving on to the next slide, they're showing some of the uh, other aspects of this, like what happens if you have too many things in your top level menu. You can get something that looks like this. You can also get menu structures that are so deep that they get complicated and you can never find your way to things. Some of that can be solved with navigation though, just how you organize stuff. This is kind of an approach you don't really think of, but um, this is really kind of a good example, right? Lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. You can't get to the second page unless you've been to the first page. And sometimes that's by intent. Like a lot of times you'll read magazine articles. You get a couple paragraphs. You got to click next so you can look at more advertising, right? But you can't get to that last page until you've clicked on the first two. So that approach can work. Now, the random approach is not necessarily a bad one. But it depends on how it's driven. Uh, notice it says not typically used for commercial sites, although you can, if you have a really bizarre, highly graphical, super artistic approach, you can make this kind of an approach work for you. It's all in the imagination and the conception, frankly. There are some principles that you can learn as a web developer. You guys are not in a design program right? The program that you signed up for is not web development and design. What, if you want to learn how to do design, you go down the hall to the graphics department, basically. However, as a web developer, it helps to know some basics. You don't have to be a master of it. And in fact, the techniques are pretty simple. And what this slide is trying to demonstrate to, to you, and I'm going to take us off this page, too, to talk about some of the other concepts, is some of the basic principles, and you see those four, you know, categories there are some of the basic principles. Basically, some people like to see things that are predictable, so repetition can actually work for you, right? If you ex expect to see a menu in a certain spot, or if you expect to see content displayed a certain way, repeating it helps the, the, the user to understand what they're looking at and where to find it. Uh, contrast, right, the, cha the change of colors like for example you can see this logo here that wouldn't work very well if it was like I don't know tan or gray because it wouldn't stand out from the background and strong contrast is actually a recommended thing like for example even this PowerPoint slide white background black text that's pretty easy to read it doesn't get much easier than that so that's something you want to consider because some people have a hard time seeing certain types of situations so uh, well, how you place Things. So, for example, they talk proximity, and like, for example, here in the center, they talk about, you know, one of their bed and breakfasts here, and the information about it in text is all grouped together. 
or if you're searching for a reservation, all that stuff is grouped together. And there's also alignment, you know, very common to see stuff like this on, out on the web where you have a, a header area, things are in columns. We tend to left justify all of our text in the English speaking world, those types of things. These are all considerations. Another thing that's important is that, that we create websites these days that people who have disabilities can see, right? Well, what if you're blind, right? We talked about this already, right? Yes, they have tools for blind people to see websites, I guess, not see, but sense websites, <laughs> you know, braille readers and, and whatever. But uh, accessibility extends beyond that, and it says, you know, there's people with disabilities, but there's also people using slow internet connections. Have you ever, like, brought up your Gmail, and then as it's loading, there'll be this little thing that says, click here for slow you know, old HTML for slow connections, you ever see that? Some websites will give you the courtesy of providing that mode because it's less graphical and it's less intensive. So that's a consideration. And what about people that are on old computers using old browsers? Do we completely ignore them? Yes, no. <laughs> you know, the strange thing is it's not really considered good practice, but that's often what I advise. Because a lot of times when we look at these textbooks, a lot of time has lapsed between when it was created and when it gets published and when we read it and do something with it. Um, and we've really stepped forward quite a ways, probably even since when this book was created. For the most part, I tell people to, you can kind of effectively ignore browsers older than Internet Explorer 10. It's even gotten to the point where Microsoft is saying, ignore Internet Explorer. So. We still have people out there, though, that are still using Windows XP. A lot of people are still using Windows XP with old browsers. So there's tools that you can use to help make sure that those people um, can work with it. And also, we can't consider or can't not consider that last bullet, which is people using mobile phones, because um, almost... I don't know, at least three quarters to 80 or 90 percent, they say, of browsing happens on mobile devices. It tends to be people that do content creation, like web developers or gamers or people like that that tend to use big screen laptops and, and desktops. That's just how it is, right? So that's a very important consideration these days. So there's actually standards for design accessibility. and uh, there's links here that you can go to for what types of things you should do to make your page accessible. Uh, if you want to look at websites that are very accessible, go to any government website because that's exactly how they design things. It's required by their mandates. So like if I went to like irs.gov, you can be sure this one's accessible because they want to bring in all the money they can. Right? I mean, think about it. So they, there's, what do you, I mean, what do you notice about this page? I mean, from an appearance standpoint. Well, say that again. Yes, everything is very easy to read by intent. Everything is very easy to to find. Everything is categorized, organized, in columns. There's not too many graphics, yet there are a few. The graphics that are there also have text with them. There's a search box. Notice you can switch languages. Oh, they want to get that money from every nationality possible. Russians can pay their taxes just like Americans can, right? So, I mean, these are all things that they'll do, but there's even more um, consideration there. But the fact that it's heavily text is not by accident. All right. So that, that's just a kind of a, a very quick view at places that are on the web. Now, what works well on a web page will really depend on what you're doing. You're putting stuff out there on the web. You're creating content. So that means you can skip the spell check, right? 
One of the problem with our editing tools that we use for creating web pages is they don't spell check. So if you're really creating a lot of text content, you probably don't want to start inside of Notepad++. You probably want to use you know, a regular authoring platform of some source, sort, and then move your text in. So if you have a lengthy article you're typing, like a five-page document, chances are you're probably writing it in Word, right? And then really all you need from there is the text. But it does, you know, give some basic guidelines here. It says avoid long blocks of text. And if you read this, think about newspapers because this all this applies for newspapers as well, right? Use bullet points. You want to get the facts out? Eddie Lacy broke his ankle. You know, Aaron Rodgers threw three touchdowns, right? I mean, that you get that stuff, right? That's the stuff you really want to know, the bullet points. Get right to the point. Use headings and subheadings so they know what they're looking at. What article are you looking at? And then short paragraphs. It's really hard to read blocks of text that are really long, especially on the screen. Breaking it up into chunks is highly advisable. Highly advisable. Choose the fonts wisely. We've talked about this stuff a little bit. These are common fonts. Do you have to stick with those? Well, these are considered the safe ones. I can argue that there's plenty of non-traditional fonts you can use that work just as well. But if you stick with one of these and, and your intent is to have somebody read your content, these will work great. These are available in every browser. Choose a good size. We already talked about con contrast. And then this one is pretty important. When you're reading stuff on the screen, keep it in narrow columns. Think newspaper once again. You don't pick up a newspaper that's like you know 18 inches wide and the sentence goes all the way across the page. There's probably like a half dozen columns in there because your eye really does not want to travel that far and then lose its place going back to the other side. Like this is fine. A few inches back and forth is fine. Same is true on the screen. So when you go to, you know, websites, let's say like this one, and I, I use this one as an example for a lot of different reasons. And just take a look at their layout approach here. Notice how they have columns. Nothing goes all the way across the screen. Things have titles. They're narrow. It's little blurbs of text. And if you want to find out more, you're going to click on one of these and, and read through, obviously. Now, you're putting stuff on the page. What becomes a link and what doesn't? You can make everything a link, right? And in some cases, that can be appropriate. But more likely... You want to be very selective about what you make linkable. More stuff you make links, the more stuff, more links you have to create and maintain. That's one thing. But the, the being selective really kind of helps. And check your spelling. <laughs> All right. A lot to learn about colors, too. Right? Has anybody ever formally studied art? I mean, aside from, like, grade school? Okay. All right. So you just uh, absorb what she does, basically, right? Actually, I've had a fair number of students that come into this program that have art backgrounds. And some of you, well, we had one person that was in our orientation class, but now is online. Um, she's an artist, and I've had a few others. And they have a leg up because they come in knowing this stuff. So they know what colors work well together. So, for example, like, does green work well with this color? I don't know until I put it on the screen. But I can tell you what, strong primary colors on the screen can often hurt your eyes. They're a little too intense. So sometimes you learn how to, you know, water those down a little bit. Certain colors complement others. And I remember I was showing you this website that Adobe has, right? And they used to call it Cooler, but they changed it to something else. See how many times I have to type this to get it right. A 
and they they show you all the different uh, color groupings or categorizations, I guess you want might want to call them. And you're going to see the same ones that are in the slideshow here, where they talk about monochromatic. So if you want to keep everything like in a certain range. And these are all mathematically generated, and therefore they work, they complement each other very nicely. So those are things you want to keep in mind, too. So, I mean, how you use color is, you know, boy, I mean, it's so subjective, right? Let me give you an example. If I went to a website like, okay, let's go to Facebook. Hopefully not signed in. We'll find out. Okay, I'm not. Um, but when you do log into this site, what color is the background? White. They obviously like blue, right? That's kind of all the colors they really use. Maybe a little gray or a little black, but they don't really use a lot of colors in their design scheme. But it's on a white screen, right? Now, if I went to somebody's, like, gaming site, Right? I'm just guessing that if I went to like Steam, right, so this is how I capture all the gamers, right? Get their attention. Go ahead, slow. Yeah, you're right. It's not Steam.com, is it? No, let's just, let's Google Steam and it'll take me there. Steam powered, thank you. All right. What do you notice here? It's dark, right? Actually, I'm su surprised it's this bright. Now, why why would they make a website for gamers darker than Facebook would make it for social people? Yeah, gamers usually spend their time in the dark, and that really bright white screen blinds them as if they're a vampire. It does, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you're right. It makes it jump out of the screen. I mean, take a look at even the images that they're, they're scrolling past here. And generally speaking, they're pretty dark. Okay, so you got to know your audience once again when you're selecting colors. So I'm going to tell you, sometimes you're working on projects. You'll get hired by somebody or you'll, your firm will get a, a thing you know, to work on. And they already have their colors picked out. Like, for example, Coca-Cola will come walk, walking in, and they'll give you the exact color. This is Coca-Cola red. It can't be one hex number off. This is our red. You know, they have it very carefully chosen. So sometimes that will be dictated to you. But if you're not restricted in that capacity, you need to consider the audience. And generally speaking, simpler is going to be more effective. Do you want, can I show you an example of something that's a little too strong color-wise? <laughs> well, actually, all right, so I was giving feedback to some students. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can pull up the URL from memory. All right, well, I guess I'm going to have to look it up. I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, so here's an example of a site that somebody did. And we're talking about color. All right? Now, he's actually building this for somebody with an actual business. Tell me what you think. Yeah, it, it's not easy to read. Yeah, it's like all the like this text here, like practically disappears, right? There's not enough contrast there. Look at the buttons. Now he would feel terrible if I was ripping apart his page like this in front of a class in person. Sorry, <laughs> but this is a really good example of like he knows how to code. He can he can lay everything out. He's got like little hover effects going, and things are nicely organized. Really, the biggest flaw here is the color. By very simply getting rid of some of these colors or simplifying them, 
You could still get that, that purple, pink, lilac thing going on very subtly, and it'll work much more effectively. But you see an example of, you know, how, like, <clears throat> not having the right color can, can hurt. All right, here's an example from another one of my students. Very color intense. And typically, if somebody has, like, such a bright rainbow of colors on a page, I kind of tend to gasp. However, in this situation, it is kind of dark. It's kind of busy, but what's the theme of his website? Arcade gaming, which has very strong primary colors usually. Yeah, exactly. It fits the look. So color can be used wisely or it can be used poorly. But there's, you know, you, you kind of have to tune into your audience. You know a good way to tune into your audience? See what other people in the, in the same category are doing. So if you're looking at a gaming website, chances are it tends to be dark and the colors are strong. But that's just how they are. And that's what the audience expects to see. So you give them what they expect, right? Not always. <laughs> All right, back over to our slideshow. Yeah, sometimes you can be very memorable. <laughs> All right, we talked about contrast. Did you guys know they actually have websites where you can plug in your site and it checks to see if your contrast is okay for people that are hard of seeing? It's not really a practice I employ very often because then I usually get results and I have to fix stuff. <laughs> it's there. I just want to let you know. There's also a bunch of different websites like that Adobe website I showed you, um, and actually that one is this one here, that help you pick colors if you're not good with it. If you're not good with it, go somewhere where they, somebody can point it out to you. Otherwise, stick with real basics. All right. I, I always like looking at stuff like this because what is good for somebody, right? I mean, if you're looking at, like, the top one, obviously that's aimed, aimed towards children, right? Clearly. Just from the color scheme. Photography website with lots of graphics, that makes sense. Mr. Snurpy <laughs> or my Snurpy. <laughs> Alright, I won't even go there. <laughs> Alright. Now, lots and lots of websites out there are doing some pretty fancy things graphically these days. And a lot of them, and I'm trying to think of a couple in particular, and I think LinkedIn does it, so that's why I'm going here. So here I am at the LinkedIn website. I land on the page. Well, what is it that you guys see here? Is this how you would design a web page? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So this, this is the same thing that Facebook does, right? You go to Facebook, and what does it ask you to do? You're either logging in or signing up. Once you get into the site, you get a completely different site. And this is a consideration, too. Like, how are you guys pulling people in? And, in fact, can anybody think of, like, any websites that are really graphically cool when you land on them? All right. Guys, I'm sure you go to this one all the time. Yeah. Girls ever go to the site? Oh, you got to. <laughs> All right. But I do this for very much with intent. Tell me what you see in this design. $10? That's the first thing I see. It is. Exactly correct. Spot on, Julianne. Right? There's not seemingly a lot going on here. We got a little logo. There's a couple little menu items up here at the top, right? Basically it looks like three different columns. So you got a picture, some information, a picture. And I guess if you scroll down you can see more. Very graphical. And you know, I'm not employed by these guys. I'm just pointing out to you what I think 
in a lot of ways is good web design. It's very clean, highly graphical, clearly intended for a male audience. That's a joke. It's very much aimed towards a female audience, and that's kind of interesting, right? Because it shows you that there's some generalizations that you can make about the audience. These people are looking for boots, right, or shoes. Well, if you're selling shoes or boots, you better have some pictures of them, right? And they, they, for the most part, better be clickable. You better have stuff on sale. But this is just kind of an one of those interesting sites I, I often use as an example because of considering the audience that you're going for. Somebody else named like a major website that you go to fairly often. Okay. That's another one I always use. Now, Amazon. Keep in mind here world's largest retailer makes Walmart look like a mom and pop that's how big they are all right they've changed their look a lot over the last few years they used to be the textbook example of a site that had too complicated a navigation system and actually it's still pretty complicated if you start hovering and hovering and hovering and click and clicking through I mean oh my god they got a lot going on but it's the world's largest retailer so how do they solve their navigation issues big search box at the top just start typing you want to see what I bought today I bought a Raspberry Pi so I, I had a Raspberry Pi right but then I bought the case and the proper power supply for it, and some little heat sinks and other stuff. It was like twelve bucks, thirteen dollars, something like that. But I went to Amazon and I bought it for a number of different reasons. What, what's so cool about Amazon? I mean, let's talk about what you see on the screen right now. Notice repetition. Other products are listed. Pretty simple layout. There's a lot going on, but it's a fairly simple layout. Things are where you expect to see them. There's images. You know that if you click on something, you can pull up more information. And I know that you guys probably come to Amazon all the time and at least look, maybe not shop. But the, the way they have stuff laid out is kind of like things that we expect on a commerce site. We want to see what we're buying, right? So pictures are good. We want to know what it costs, what it's called, who made it? What are the reviews? What are its features? Are there any other products that are like it? What else might I want to buy? Right, so these are common things. And notice really, white background, black text. The emphasis is towards clean, but it is very busy. But you know what, on a site like this, you expect it to be busy. So there's an expectation that goes with it. All right, let's go back. All right, let's check out their little advice here. Careful with large graphics. I think we've talked that one to death, right? Always use your alt attribute. Be sure your message gets across, that's why. It says use animation only if it makes the page more effective and provide a text description. So that's not something that we've really encountered yet. But some people really don't like it when you go to a web page and it like moves around. Have you ever gone to a web page where the background's a video? Or you go to a web page and an ad pops up in front of you? That's a pet peeve of mine. Right? But everybody's got to pay the bills somehow. Right? They talk here about some real basic concepts that you need to be aware of. And I plan on going through a lot of these slides pretty quickly, so if you're wondering. All right. When you're working with text and you're doing graphic layout, you guys ever see fonts that look like this where they're pixelated on the edges? And this is an ex explanation of what is aliased and anti-aliased. So if you have a choice when you're creating like graphical fonts, 
you choose anti-alias to get rid of those rough edges. That's just more terminology than anything else. Yep. Use only necessary images. Well, you know, I guess that's a little subjective. Keep the file small. We've, we've talked about that. Reuse images. Well, I think that's a little subjective, too. We also talked about how quickly things download. I showed that tool in Photoshop that could help you determine how fast things will download and how long it will take on, on slow connections. Now, you guys can say 56K. Well, we don't even use modems that go that slow. But you know what? If you're on a phone sometimes and you drop out of a digital signal, guess how fast it goes? Modem speeds. Why it's so painful. So you still have to consider that. So a one megabyte image with a 56K modem is 149 seconds, two minutes to load. On a T1 line, almost instant. Almost instant. So let's get a browser vote here. How many people are Chrome people? That's your primary browser. Anybody a Firefox person? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, used to be. I think you'll, <clears throat> when you look at these statistics, people that tend these days to like do coding will use Chrome and Firefox predominantly. People that tend to be hyper techy tend to use Firefox. Not the spoiler for Chrome people. Chrome is now the most popular browser, but what else is out there? Yeah, Safari on a Mac. Edge, this is Edge. We were using it earlier. Internet Explorer replacement. There's also Opera. And I don't know if I have that loaded on this machine or not. Uh, apparently not. But Opera is also a web browser that you can download. It's been around just as long as all the others. It's just never had more of a market share than like 3, 4, 5 percent. But the people that like it, love it. And it was responsible for a lot of the innovations that we have, even though they never got to be the biggest browser. It's actually pretty cool. All right. So now, why does that matter to us? Because sometimes you create a page, you look at it in one browser, great. Because I use Chrome all the time. It looks great in Chrome. But then I bring it up in Firefox, and the whole thing is broken. That happens. The reality is, is that all the browsers render HTML and CSS hypothetically according to an ideal standard set by W3, but they don't all execute it the same way. And you have to test across all the different browsers, all the different operating systems, all the different devices to make sure your page loads correctly. Did you know that your browser, Chrome, for example, if you go up to the uh, menus here, and actually probably the easier way to do it is to do an inspect element. If you right click, you guys ever done this? Somewhere where there's not content, a blank part of the page, click inspect. And it brings up this set of tools. And typically, you, this is the, the mode you drop into, where it shows you your HTML in a hierarchy. And then on the left side, you see your CSS and a couple of other things. But it also has this little icon. See this icon right here in the toolbar? If you click on it, it brings up various devices, screen sizes, resolutions, and you can see what it might look like on a particular device. It's cool and it's kind of scary, actually, <laughs> um, because you can try a lot of different approaches and you can see that all right well maybe this doesn't look so good on an iPad now Amazon you can be pretty rest assured that they have their stuff designed to work but chances are if I looked at my Walking Dead page it might not work quite as well because I really didn't put any time into working around that but you want to test in all the browsers as you're coding even have Firefox open, have Chrome open, have Edge open, have Opera open, have your phone open, pull it up, see what it looks like. Don't guess. Professionals don't guess, they try it. All right, where do you put your navigation? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the standard now, right? You put it across, you usually have your logo or whatever, and then you have like a bar that goes across. But I think I've told you guys in the, in the old days, navigation, I was always on the left side. Then for a while it was like left side and top. And now we kind of see it all over the place. But top is what people, your audience, expect to see. So we tend to stick with that. And it really it is, it is best practice. And once again, it, mimic, it mimics print design. Print design usually goes that way too. All right, here's another thing that you're going to consider as you're working on that one assignment, and that is a wireframe. Now, a wireframe very simply is a simplistic graphical representation of what your site's going to look like. It can be something that you hand draw, believe it or not. Or, if you're so inclined, you can actually pull up a graphics program like Illustrator or Photoshop, or maybe even something more primitive. Even You could even do it with PowerPoint, frankly. PowerPoint's got all sorts of tools where you can add text, draw little boxes, drop in an image, right? Think, think about those capabilities. And you create a little image that looks like this that might show, generally speaking, what the site's going to look like. Now notice, there's no real details in here. They just say header, heading, subheading, image, bullet list, whatever it happens to be. So you get the general idea of what the page layout's going to be. Now, even though that's all dummy content, I mean, yeah, that looks like a pretty decent design, right? There's three columns, there's navigation at the top. And chances are, if you stick with a design like that, it'll probably turn out pretty well. But that's called a wireframe. And in fact, wireframes can kind of like have many different aspects to them. So for example, you might have a home page, or you might have a page that just has information on it. That might look like this. So you might have a couple different wireframes. In fact, you might have a few different approaches. And what they're really kind of going through, if you're reading the slides, in the background is what makes more sense? What makes more sense in terms of like how I place the stuff on the page? Is it easier to read this or is it easier to read this? They're telling you that this is better. See, better. And then they even have best. So what they're really trying to show you here is where the stuff might sit relative to like the screen width. Which one draws your eye the most? I'll leave that up to you. I mean, the, the, the point is that there's a lot of little considerations like that. And that's really what this chapter is about, is thinking about those things. Um, and often the best way to plan out a site, I mean, take a look at this. Look at the one on the top. Everything's moved off to the left. That also used to be an old convention. Now what we expect to see is if the content is not full screen, that it's centered in the middle. That's the convention. Does that mean that a super wide layout is bad? Not necessarily. Because a wide layout like that might be able to dynamically adjust. So in the, the top one, you can see the banner goes all the way across, but so does the content. In the second one, the banner goes all the way across the top, which looks nice. But the content is narrowed up because it's easier to read. So once again, it, this is pretty subjective stuff. Very, very important now is the mobile environment. And very often you will find pages. So for example, we were looking at all these different sites. So let's let's take like LinkedIn for example. I'm actually going to sign in just so you can get like what the page looks like. Right? And then I'm going to come out of full screen mode and I'm going to kind of see what happens as I narrow up. It's not very good at responding, is it? This is LinkedIn. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jason. They What they're going to push you to do is like, why aren't you downloading the app? Because right now, they can recognize the fact that we're looking with a regular browser, so they're not giving us the mobile view. That Boston Globe site that I was showing you, wherever I happen to put that, 
this one is marvelous just for that reason. In fact, this is one of the first sites that was designed that was responsive. And if I've showed this to you already, I, I apologize. I think I did, right? Well, here it is again. And as it becomes smaller, it dynamically adjusts, goes into narrower and narrower modes, then it switches to tablet view. Eventually, it jumps down to phone view. Notice how even the menus change. And all of that is done with something we call media queries. And the preference in modern design is that you set up a web page that will adjust like that. It can be a little tricky, especially when you start out, but there's tools that can help you as well. But mobile is very important. There's a lot of things for mobile that are important. One thing is, is like, you know, if this is actually my phone, that's going to be, you know, that's not too bad to click on. But if you ever, like, go to a web page on the phone, it's like, how do I click on that? you got to zoom in, and hopefully you click the right thing, and not, like, buy now, you know, that type of thing. So, very important little considerations. This whole point of responsive design, that's what you were seeing with the Boston Globe site. There's actually um, articles that you can read about it and really good examples for using uh, media queries. This site is very cool. I encourage you to check it out. And then um, the author here has a little bit of a checklist. All things you should think about when you're creating. You know, definitely know what you're creating, why you're creating it, and who it's for, and that will dictate a large part of it. If you're not really good with colors and design, keep it really simple. Simple looks better. It's worked for Google for a long time, right? Very simple, very effective. All right, folks, that ends this chapter. We're going to take a break.